reading our sermon today, but I want to thank Rory. She's going to be reading the um, scripture for us today. Today's scripture reading is found in Romans 10, 13 to 15. Romans 10, 13 through 15. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in, whom, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Good morning. How's everybody today? Happy Sabbath. <laughs> um, all right, let me get settled here. So um, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. It has been two years since I've given a sermon. Um, and I'm actually really anxious. I've been anxious um, for a while. And um, what's interesting is how God just kind of calms the anxieties that we sometimes have. Um, sorry, because this week in um, our Bible class, I teach middle school, um, in our Bible class, we've been studying Moses, the story of Moses, and you know that part where um, Moses is like, yeah, God, can't you find someone else to go preach, <laughs> you know, like, it's not for me, like, I'm not, you know, like, it's not my forte, or it's not my gift, as some of us say, um, and God's like, did I not make your tongue? Did I not make your mouth? And um, I'm like, man, it's like God was putting it there. It's like as, as, as nervous um, of a wreck as I might be today, it's sometimes what God is telling us to do. It's just we just got to do it. You know, like there's no other way to, to say it. Um, so let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer, if that's okay with you guys. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, um, I thank you so much, Lord, for just for the Sabbath, Lord. I thank you for this day that we can come together, we can worship together, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, because uh, we are not in darkness, Lord. Um, we have you that we can cling to, Lord, and thank you for so many promises, Lord. Thank you for the blood of Jesus um, that was given up for us, Lord, and thank you for the hope of a better land. Um, Lord, today, as as we share together, Lord, I ask that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and fill this, this place with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, um, hide, be, hide me behind the cross, Lord. May it be your words. May I just be able to share what you have done in my life um, and just share with people what you are able, more and more and more than able to do in their lives, Lord. Uh, we love you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray, amen. So as you guys can see, the title of this, um, it's a little unorthodox, I know, but it's Ready, Set, Go. Um, and I know it might sound a little weird, but there's a, there's a whole point of this. Um, today, what I'm going to be sharing is we all have kind of a sort of a testimony, you know, and actually we have several testimonies of how God has worked in our lives. Um, and I want to share a portion of it. Um, my testimony is what I know best um, and how God has worked in my life. So um, sometimes, like, people might, you know, there's people that can argue with you the, the, what a verse might mean in the Bible, but what, they can't really argue with your testimony because it's something you experienced. You know what I mean? And so I'm going to share part of my testimony with you guys. Just um, when I finally decided to just surrender completely to God. And so that's where we're going to be. Um, kind of talking about today. And so um, I chose the verse, Romans 10, 13 to 15. Um, I know that in the Adventist church, you guys have probably heard of the Great Commission, right? <laughs> Everybody kind of has that memorized since they were little. Matthew 28, 
um, verses 19 to 20, it says, go ye therefore, right? Um, I love that verse. Um, I love that verse. But I'm going to tell you right now that it was this verse that actually, and I have it just written all over my Bible, like that was the verse where God led me to become a missionary. Um, being a missionary is one of the, um, the I, I guess you could say the highlights of my life. That's where my life really, really changed. Um, this is the verse that when God showed it to me, it was like a sin I need to go. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory there. Just like I tell my kids when they write their English, uh, when they write their I'm like, you need to give me the setting. You need to give me the characters. You need to tell me what's going on in that first paragraph. So I'm kind of going to give that to you. But before I do, um, you can go back. We're going to read that verse um, again. It says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord, go back to Romans 10, um, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So um, the backstory to this is I grew up in the Adventist church. Um, I went to Adventist school. There's a little commercial, <laughs> a little commercial here for Adventist education. Um, I love the Adventist church. I love um, Christian education, and I grew up in it. Um, but I'm going to be honest in telling you that it wasn't until college where God became my personal God, where it was like, you know, the, the Adventist God or the Christian God or my parents' God or, you know, my family's God. But it wasn't until college where I really, really experienced, like, this is my God, you know? But the good thing of that is, like, I had learned about God all through it. So I, it only led to that point. I'm not saying it can't happen for people before. Um, but the reason why is because it wasn't until college where I actually got into my first relationship. Okay? Um, my first, it was, my very first, I had just, I, during high school, I was like, no, God, like, I'm, I'm going to focus on my studies. Come from a low-income family. There was no way we could afford going to college, so I had to get really good grades, get scholarships, get those grants in, right? Um, it's the only way I could go to college because I knew that I wanted what I wanted to do with my life. And so um, when I was in college, it's when I got a little distracted and I went into a relationship. Um, you can go to the next verse. Um, and it didn't last very long, but as most of you guys know, your first love you know, it's the one that like, ugh. Like you can sometimes, if I remember, I remember it and I laugh now, right? Because I was like 18 or 19. But um, it almost like physically hurt. You, you guys know what I mean by that? Like it, it's just like you, like there's like a, literally like an ache where your heart, and I know that that doesn't really feel like it's your brain, but there's sometimes like it's a physical hurt. Um, and I was just so heartbroken. And again, I went back to what I grew up in Adventist education. Like, I knew that there was a God that could heal me. And there is this verse that I love, and it's still very, very close to my heart, together with the one um, Ms. Baptist said, um, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. But this one is, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are in crushed spirit. I was very brokenhearted during that time, and I knew that God, if I allowed myself to draw near to God, God would fix that. Um, and it took some time, but I fell in love with God. I, I just, it was, it was sort of like a, you know how there's a saying? Um, there's a saying that says like, you know, oh, time will heal all wounds. And I learned then and there that no, <laughs> like it's God who heals those wounds. You can go to the next slide. Um, it's God, the ones that heals us. And, and he didn't just heal me. Like it wasn't just like I fell in love with God. It was, it was a he filled me up and he restored me. Um, and it was, it was just an amazing thing. I, when I, I remember reading this verse and he heals the broken, brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Again, this is, this, these, these are all verses that I remembered from my youth, from elementary, from middle school, from high school. 
but now they were becoming a reality. Every time you read the Bible, depending on your situation, it's going to hit differently, right? It's a lot, like the Bible is so alive. Every aspect of time and every event that you're going to, going through. And so Lord kind of just filled me up. And every time I think of it, um, I, I think of that song, oh, fill it up. You know that song? Like, and, and you can go to the next slide. The ne- he just kind of like overflowed me. So it was like I had fallen in love with God. I had fallen in love with Jesus. He filled me up with his love. There was just too much. And it was like, okay, God, like, I got to share this. <laughs> it was like, like, I was like, I was so full of this love. And I knew in college, and I knew a lot of people that had gone through these relationships, and they had been so broken, they didn't know what to do with themselves. And I was like, how, like I need to share what God can do. I, I need to share how God can heal, how God can restore, how God can cause us to love, can cause us to fall in love with him, and I need to share it with others. Um, and I asked God... I asked God, um, you know, help me, tell me how. Show me how I can share with others this love you've showed me. Like, I don't want to keep it to myself because it's not fair that I have to go through a breakup or a heartbrokenness and I don't, and I get to heal from it. But there are other people that don't get to experience that. They don't get to heal from their brokenness. And so um, it was then that I was like, okay, God, just show me what I need to do. Um, and so <laughs> I'm going to do a little pause here because I'll be like, just watch out. Um, because when you ask God to do something or when you pray for something, God might just give it to you. you <laughs> some of you guys are laughing because you know exactly what I mean. Like if you pray for patience, sometimes God will give you that stubborn kid that you always wanted. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sometimes, like, that's how God works. Like, he's like, okay. Um, and there began, when you pray for something, and it's a good thing, like how to share the gospel or how to share his love, God will give it to you. And so there began the wildest ride of my life. Um, it was a roller coaster. Um, I love roller coasters. Um, but... Ever since I decided to go all in for God, ever since I was like, okay, God, like, use me, do what you got to do with me, like, I don't even care how my hair looks or whatever, like, just put me in there. Whew. Um, I have not had a single boring day in my life. God is not a boring God. If you think he's a boring God, ask him to tell you what to do. And trust me, um, I'm, a, I'm a middle school teacher. Um, I spend eight hours a day with 14 kids. There's a, a moment of my life it's not going to be boring. So, some of you guys know what that's like. Like, it, it's not boring. Sometimes I even wish that I'm, like, bored. <laughs> Sometimes, like, man, I wish I could just go to school and not feel, like, and, and be bored. But I know better than to pray for that, okay? Um, because I know that God does answer prayers. And so... Um, He answered my prayers, and God actually sent me to the jungle. Um, Now, some of you guys have heard my my, uh, children's story, but um, I went with an organization called Adventist Frontier Missions. Um, They're located in Berrien Springs, so just a couple hours from here. Um, And the Lord sent me to the Philippine jungle on an island of Palawan. Um, And it was there. There or there. There was no other choice. Like, that's where God wanted me to be. Um, That's where God wanted me to show and to share his love with others. Um, And that while I was there, I found out that all that love, I still needed more. (laughs) Um, Because I was in a place with different culture, a different people group, like different languages, different customs, different traditions, different, different everything. And so... I had to pray, like, God, give me more love. Give me your love. Share, sh- show me how to love these people. Show me how to see these people the way that you see them. And remember what I said about be careful what you ask for? Well, <laughs> clearly I hadn't learned my lesson yet um, because God did. 
um, it didn't take too long for me to quite genuinely just fall in love with these people. Um, my kids, um, I was a middle school, high school teacher, so just kind of like joint together. Um, kids have this amazing ability to just like crawl their way into your hearts. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very special, it's like their specialty. Um, your kids are doing a really good job of that, by the way. Um, but I was, just, I, was, I was just so in love with these people, and I wanted to share everything that I could, everything that I knew, everything that God had ever done for me with them. Um, but this roller coaster that God had sent me on was just getting started. Um, there were physical ups and downs in that mountain. For, like, the roller coaster could be physical up in that, um, that mountain. There were times where I thought I was going to die of exhaustion going up a mountain, um, but I made it. Um, there were times where I thought I was going to die of malaria or typhoid, dysentery, a snake bite, falling down the mountain, which I did several times. Um, but God got me through it. There were mental ups and downs. Um, I love teaching science. I love science. Um, but I never thought it'd be so hard to teach science in another language, in a language where they don't even have the word for cell because they can't see cells. Um, having to teach there was a mental roller coaster. You had to teach from one student edition. There was no teacher editions. They weren't in the same language that we were trying to teach in. You had to carbon copy everything. You guys remember carbon copying? Those were my worksheets. I had to sit there and carbon copy my worksheets. And there was no Google. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's not a single day that goes by now where my kids don't ask me a question where I have no idea what the answer is. And so we'll Google it together. Um, but over there, I didn't have that. But there's this verse in the Bible that says, like, he who lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord who gives sparingly. And so, like, God gave me some answers that to this day I don't even know how they came up. You know, like, there were also... Um, emotional ups and downs. Um, I was in a different culture. I was in a culture where school uh, wasn't deemed a necessity. We were, people were just trying to survive. Um, and so, I, understandably, but sometimes for things to get better, education is one of the best ways to do that. And so, um, I lived in a culture where girls going to school after the age of 10 wasn't wanted. And so that emotional up and down and that battle with like getting my kids and the struggle with getting my kids to stay in school, sometimes against their parents' wishes, was very, very taxing. Um, and then there were the spiritual battles. There was the spiritual roller coasters, the ups and downs when it came to the spiritual realm. Um, but I'm going to pause here really quickly um, and to tell you that actually I was only supposed to stay one year in the Philippines. Okay, and what happened one year later was I had to come to a decision of whether I was going to stay or whether I was going to go home. Um, I fasted and I prayed. Um, I saw the need for me to stay there. Um, I had just learned the language somewhat effectively, you know, to at least be able to communicate. Um, and God put it in my heart to stay. And it wasn't an easy thing for him to convince me because I am Hispanic. <laughs> and I'm very family-oriented. Um, and I miss my mom. <laughs> um, and I miss my sister. And I just I wanted to come home and see them. Um, but then God led me. I remember one evening as I sat there, I was just looking at the mountains, and it had just rained. And you know how that smell after it rains? Well, that's one of my favorite smells. But I was just sitting there, and I was reading um, God's word, and he led me to this verse. Um, and it's found in Matthew 10, verse 37, 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And so, um, kind of hard to argue with that. 
And so like Abraham, I had to put my family on the altar and to surrender them to God. Um, that and a lot of other verses were the ones that led me to stay another year. And the roller coaster just kept coming. I told you, God's not a boring God. Like, if you give him all your life, he's going to take you to the ups and downs. And with the school, with the church, with the clinic, with the hikes, with the sickness, with the Bible studies, um, and laughing with my kids and crying with my girls and um, giggling with God over, you know, funny mess-ups or not having a copier or um, sobbing with God over things, um, missing my family, make a, getting a new family. Um, I still talk to a lot of people from over there. Um, missing my friends, making new friends, missing Mexican food. <laughs> the rich know what I'm talking about. Missing Mexican food, right? But learning about amazing new uh, food. Um, there was a lot of ups and downs. But God carried me through it all. And just like that, two years later. Um, but it was different now. Now had come again the decision, Yesenia, are you going to stay or are you going to go? <sighs> My family, I still miss them, but I had already made the decision that, you know, God was going to be first. Um, but something happened differently this time. This time, the decision for me wasn't that difficult um, because there was something that happened in the summer of my second year. Um, and I'm going to share that experience with you, with you guys, but I need to give you a little bit of backstory here. Um, there were people in the mountains that had never heard of the name of Jesus. And there were a lot of mountains. So there were a lot of people who still needed to be reached. And one of the ways that we were able to reach people um, over there is through our clinic. So we had a clinic. I was a school teacher. Um, but sometimes, if I wasn't at school, I was at the clinic. There were always short staff, you know, like everybody gets sick. Um, and so one of the ways that we were able to witness through, uh, to people was um, through medicine. And um, people had started to see that the missionaries didn't just have medicine. They had something else. And so we had a lot of people coming in, a lot of people coming in. Um, and a lot of the times, we had people bringing their loved ones that were being controlled by a dark force. Um, and you remember how I paused there for a moment to tell you about the spiritual roller coasters? Well, it was a constant warfare, spiritually speaking. The great controversy was just so vivid, um, you, you, could almost, you could almost see it, you could almost feel it. Um, we were constantly being bombarded with things. Um, you could tell that someone wasn't happy. And sometimes our nights were spent in song, sometimes we spent them in prayer, sometimes we sent them to scripture, sometimes... We stayed awake the whole night just to do those things so that we would feel God's presence with us at all times. And I can remember um, the story, this event that happened, has to do with this woman, you can go to the next slide, Chris, named Licia. Um, one day, Licia walks into the clinic. She has her young daughter with her. Her husband and her mom and her dad are with her. Um, and you can see she has like this sadness in her eyes. Um, and you can also see it, she's not herself. So for those of you who have experienced that know what I'm talking about. Um, and from the description that the family was giving us, we, it, was, it was clear that Alicia was in a battle that she could never win alone. Um, and with the missionaries, we had decided that we were going to take shifts at the, um, at the clinic every night. We were going to sleep at the clinic. Um, and the reason being is um, the darkness feels more at home at night. Okay? And I can still remember the time, and I can still remember the day 
but it was the third night into Alicia being at our clinic um, when at one in the morning I was awakened to screams coming from the clinic. And I grabbed my headlamp and I grabbed my tajung. This is tajung, this is a native wrap that we, that we use. Um, I jumped out, I grabbed my sinilas, my, my sandals, and I ran to the clinic and um, the career missionary told me, she's like, get between the door and don't let these people come back in. And I was half asleep and I just didn't know what was happening and she told me just please do that. So I, I stood there and I, and I fought against these two men trying to come back into the clinic and um, I didn't know what I was doing and all of a sudden I see um, a woman being dragged out of the, by the missionaries and what is going on? And the people that were being dragged out of the clinic were Alicia's family. The two men that I was struggling against were her husband and her father. And the woman being dragged out of the clinic was her own mother. And it took me a minute to understand all the different conversations that were going on, but thank God that I was starting, I, I, I knew the language pretty well. And then I did. Now it's important, I need you guys to understand that I'm not telling you this story to scare you, and much less to entertain you, okay? I'm telling you, I'm sharing this story with you because it is, a, it is one of the ways that God taught me a very, very important lesson, and I'm hoping to share this lesson with you as well. And if I'm being honest, sometimes I think back, and I think that God knows me well enough to know that this might have been the only way that I would have understood that lesson. I'm pretty headstrong. You guys didn't get that. Um, and, and this is what had happened. Um, sometime during the night, uh, Licia had begun to manifest what was controlling her. So I, I tried to get language that was a little bit easier for you to understand and not the children that much. I don't know if you guys are comfortable with talking that, about this. Um, but it's what God told me, so I don't really care if you're comfortable or not. Sorry. But um, what had happened is that as she manifested this in the middle of the night, her parents and her husband had woken up and they had come face to face with this with darkness. And they had just been completely overcome with fear. You can go to the next slide, Chris. So much so, so much fear that they had grabbed what they could and everybody has one of these, um, I have several. Um, in the jungle, they're native wraps. And so they had grabbed what they could, and they had tried to strangle whatever was controlling their daughter out of her. Here was their own daughter. It, their, own, their own daughter, their, their wife, the mother of this child, and flesh of their own flesh, and blood of their own blood, and out of fear, they had almost taken her life. And, and finally, we all missionaries, um, with the, door, the clinic doors and the windows closed, we all sat down on the outside and we started singing and we started praying and we started reading scripture because we knew this was going to be a long night. We could feel this presence. It was a smothering, dark presence. And I have been scared a few times in my life. Um, but I have never experienced fear the way I did at that moment. <clears throat> I remember not being able to breathe normally. I remember shaking uncontrollably. And I remember not being able to speak, much less sing, like all the other missionaries were doing. So I just sat there. I, was, I sat there be, being overwhelmed with this fear. But why? This wasn't the first time I had seen this. It wasn't the first time I had experienced it. It wasn't the first plate patient that had come that, with a dark force controlling her, and it wasn't going to be the last. And in fact, it wasn't the last time. But why was I being allowed to experience this fear? And, and as I sat there, all my Adventist education came out, and all those verses started coming out. And one of the verses... Um, that came out was this one, and I'm sure you guys know it. it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
And I repeated it to myself, and I repeated it to myself because I knew, I know whose I am. And I knew and I know who I belong to. Another verse that I kept repeating over and over and over in my head was, you can go to the next one, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And yet, as I repeated this, as I sang in my head because I couldn't sing out loud, for the next 30 minutes, I experienced this overwhelming sense of fear. And I prayed to God that it would go away quickly, and I knew that God was with me, so why was I still being allowed to experience this fear? Until God told me, God calls me Mija. Okay, this is when God speaks to me. It's Mija. He calls me with a, it's a Spanish of daughter, right? He was like, Mija, go for a walk. And he told me, go for a walk. And I got up. Went for a walk in the middle of the jungle, midnight, right, past midnight. And as I walked, the fear slowly dissolved. And I started to cry. As, as, as my mind was open to the lesson that God was trying to teach me, and he just helped me realize, Yesenia, this is the kind of fear I allowed you to experience it because this is the kind of fear that people live with every single day when they don't know me. I lost it. I could barely handle it for 30 minutes. And people were living with this, like it was normal. And children were growing up in these, in these houses and generation after generation thinking that this is a normal way of living, that they were alone, that when they get sick, there's nobody to help them, that when there's a darkness, there's nobody to come to for help, that when their parents are going through divorce or when they're going through divorce, there's nobody that they can reach out to and that can save them. So why was I? And why are we letting people to continue without the knowledge of God? Without the knowledge of an almighty, a loving father, a powerful one. Then I decided, it was then and there that I decided that I would be a missionary for the rest of my life. <laughs> at home, overseas, at a school, at a church, in a clinic, I would do everything I could to share God and Jesus and the good news of a land where there's no more death and there's no more sickness, but there's joy and there's peace and that blessed hope that we have. This experience, along with others, is what made a difference. And I hope that it also makes a difference for you. So this verse... Romans 10, 13, and 15, um, isn't just a verse that encouraged me to become a missionary. It's a verse that encourages me every day to stay a missionary. Um, we need to get ready to get set and to go. We need to fulfill that great commission. We need to be doing all the time, anytime, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family, overseas, at home, in the clinic, wherever you are, are you happy? Are you safe? Do you have that hope? There are people who have never, don't even know that that's a possibility. There are people that, that live in this darkness, and how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard? And how can they hear unless you tell them? We must tell them. We must share Jesus. Bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the light. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy and the blood of Jesus that covers us, Lord. Lord, help us to not be ashamed. Help us to not be anxious. Help us not be um, scared or fearful, Lord. Um, 
this is something that you've asked of us to share our experiences, to share what you can do, um, and to share with whoever, whomever, whenever. Lord, give us boldness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to be willing to do that, Lord. Um, may we never leave this place the same way we came in, Lord. Um, may we be willing, willing to go to the ends of the earth just for you, Lord, and to do what you ask us to do. Um, help us to sacrifice things like family sometimes um, in order to do your will. Um, give us the strength and the courage, the wisdom, and um, the knowledge that we're going to need. We love you, and happy Sabbath. In your precious name we pray, amen.